Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Good morning. My name is John Nordlinger. I work in Microsoft Research, External Research and Programs. I'm very excited today to present Dr. W. Lewis Johnson. Lewis Johnson is a well-known AI researcher from the University of Southern California, and he's done one of the most socially relevant computer software packages I can imagine, and that is teaching the world um, language, and in particular, teaching our U.S. military Arabic. Whether you're liberal or conservative, I'm sure you can appreciate the huge need for this. And having recently been in the military myself, I can assure you there's a huge need for tools like this. And it's just great that somebody actually took an effort to go beyond research and make something relevant for society. So here's Lewis Johnson. Thank you all watching remotely, and thank you for those in the room. Thanks a lot, John. And uh, yeah, I'm happy to talk with you guys, happy to talk with you some, about something that I'm very passionate about, the uh, project we're, we're doing here and the potential that it has to really uh, uh, innovate the way language and culture is taught, not just in the military, but, but generally. Uh, yeah, I am at the University of Southern California at the Information Sciences Institute. I've been there for a number of years, heading a research lab in AI uh, technology for education, and uh, also uh, game technology and its applications for learning. And this particular project I'm going to be showing you has attracted so much interest that we've actually formed a company to actually uh, develop this, turn it into a product. So I, in addition to worrying about the research questions, I also worry about the issues of how to actually integrate this into an actual curriculum that people can use uh, for language and, and culture, as well as how to turn this into an effective uh, educational product. And uh, um, we have an audience here in the room today. I welcome you to ask questions anywhere along the line. I'm really going to be showing you, demonstrating you what you're doing, and it's up to you to tell me when I um, uh, uh, provoke some interest. Those of you out in the greater Microsoft um, community welcome you to uh, contact me if you have any additional questions. So. The goal of the tactical language and culture training system is to help people rapidly acquire skills in foreign language and culture. Unlike a lot of um, language courses that are really designed for a select few, training them to be linguists, this is designed to give everybody useful communication skills quickly. And uh, the, the several um, aspects of our philosophy which contribute to that, one is that we focus heavily on spoken communication. We've, as we view it, whether or not you want to learn or read, to read and write the language, it's going to be your communication skills that provide an important foundation of your language abilities. We focus on what you need to accomplish particular tasks. Uh, this is important because it gives people a context in which to apply what they're learning and it also gives them uh, a way of seeing that they're actually making progress because they know immediately how they can apply the skills that they're learning. And we focus throughout on um, promoting and maintaining learner motivation. And we have a number of techniques to achieve that, but that's, that's really um, a, a common thread here. We, uh, as, as I view it, a lot of people uh, fail to make progress in learning foreign language because they, they find that it's boring or they find that they're not making progress, they feel like they're not good at it, so they lack self-confidence. All of these are, are motivation-related issues one way or another. And basically what we want to convince people is that if, you, if they actually apply what they're learning in this environment, that they, are actually, they, they can learn this and they can succeed. There are a combination of capabilities that we've incorporated into, uh, into an integrated package. Uh, there are a couple of game-based um, uh, uh, experiences. One, which you see on the top right, the mission game, where you, as the player, uh, enter, you lead a um, team in a town, and you need to uh, talk to the local people, make contact with a local leader, and plan a, uh, a joint project with him. There's an arcade game where it's sort of, you know, like 
other arcade games like Pac-Man that you've seen, except that you use spoken commands in the language to, to navigate. And what we call the Skill Builder, which is a set of interactive lessons that help you develop the skills that you need to, um, uh, to uh, be able to play the games successfully and also apply your skills in the real world successfully. So here are a couple of screenshots on the left from the mission game where our hero has made contact with the local sheikh in this, in this district for the first time. And on the right, the arcade game where you can give um, spoken commands like um, go up to the mosque and turn left and then your character will follow those instructions. So I'm going to now immediately segue to a demonstration that will give you um, so, some views of what it is that uh, we're doing and I welcome you to um, ask questions as I go through this. I will make an attempt to comment on what's going on as we go through this and then I'll continue the uh, briefing materials and, and, and explain a bit more about what's going on here. So, so I'm bringing up the engine here. There's actually two parts to the engine. There is um, what we call the virtual culture engine, which is basically uh, built on top of a commercially um, available uh, engine, the uh, Unreal Engine. We developed it and customized it specifically for these types of game-based um, language learning applications. And then there's another program uh, here that is managing the interface, uh, controlling the characters where all the AI resides. At the present time, those two are separate processes that communicate via a socket, um, but in the future we plan to uh, um, integrate them more closely. So here is the main screen of the um, of Tactical Iraqi. Uh, I should mention that this is uh, one of a few different training systems that we have um, uh, developed or been developing for different languages and dialects, but um, Tactical Iraqi is the one which is uh, most highly developed at the present time. So what we have here, we have a set of pre and post tests where we can initially get background information about each individual learner's uh, learner. We can also um, give them a test at the end to assess how much they've learned. Uh, the skill builder, the arcade game, and the mission game. Uh, what we typically do when we get people started uh, with this is we kind of give them an orientation a little bit of, of each of these different major components and then leave them on their own to go and do the um, um, additional uh, training themselves. But I'm just going to jump in here into the, um, into the mission game to give you a sense of sort of what the target is uh, that, that we're aiming here. And what I'm about to do is stuff which trainees pretty re reliably are able to do on their own after about a day or so of training. So here I am in the mission game. Um, it consists of a series, a set of different scenes. Uh, there's an initial tutor tutorial scene where you learn how to operate the interface, how to use the, um, the speech-based uh, um, and um, uh, mouse-based uh, interface, for example. Uh, a series of scenes or episodes that, um, that you train in that fit together in an overall uh, storyline, your mission. And then there is an exam scene where we get, put you into a new situation, a new mission which is related but somewhat different from what you trained on. And the goal here is to see whether you can apply what you learned to this new setting. So, so those of you who are familiar with uh, language learning pedagogy, you may be aware that people tend to draw a distinction between learning enough to be able to just repeat back rote phrases as opposed to be able to creatively utilize language. Uh, what we're aiming for is somewhere in between. We are giving lots of concrete examples of phrases that you can use, but we are also giving you enough examples and enough understanding of the language um, and as well as uh, the pragmatics, politeness, what, you know, how to address different people in different situations so that learners quickly start being able to utilize what they're learning in different ways. And, and that has an impact on the, um, on the design of the AI in the game as I'm going to show you that it has to be highly flexible so that 
somebody can do more or less anything that makes sense to them in the situation and have the non-player characters respond accordingly. So here I am. Um, uh, that's my character in the middle. He's Sergeant John Smith. Uh, he's leading a uh, civil affairs team in this uh, town in Iraq. Uh, what he needs to do is to find uh, the local leader. So in order to do that, he's got to ask around, um, try to find someone who will give him directions. And very importantly, he needs to be able to develop rapport with these people. He has to show respect to them. Um, enlist their cooperation in order to get the, um, uh, the information that, that, that he seeks. Next to him, um, his assistant, Sergeant Farris, uh, speaks Arabic and can give advice if he gets stuck. I can ask for her ad advice right now, for example. Let's try finding someone we can talk to. So the goal is that we, even when people are just beginning to learn the language or maybe a little you know, lacking confidence that they can handle the situation, we tell them, look, well, you've got your assistant with you to help you out. Try this out and see how well you can do. So now I'm going to go and, as she said, find someone uh, to talk to. And um, to cut things short, there are actually various people I could talk to, but I happen to know that the cafe across the street is a good place to find people um, who are willing to talk. So I'll just go directly on over there. Um, these characters can be def offended by a lot of things, but fortunately not, not by you running at them. That, that, and we need that in order to be able to navigate this game uh, effectively. So um, I'm going to walk up to one of these guys. and. Uh, so the little red arrow means that this character has um, recognized me and is ready to talk with me. Um, up on the top right, you see a couple of icons there. So uh, those are what we call trust meters. So the, first of all, those indicate which characters in the game are currently aware of my presence or listening to me, and what's their attitude toward me. So like right now, those green bars are about midway over, indicating that um, they don't know what to think of me yet. Um, so, um, so I now need to introduce myself. But before I do that, first of all, let me turn, take off my sunglasses. Anybody here know why taking off sunglasses is important in this context? Um, sunglasses break eye contact. So you can, uh, a lot of Americans get over there and un, unwittingly um, appear domineering or disrespectful because they fail to take the sunglasses off. Uh, I can also, using uh, the keyboard or mouse, select a hand gesture. This is reflected by the icon in the top left. So what, I'm gonna, what I've selected here is a hand over heart gesture, common uh, throughout Southwest Asia. So now when I um, start speaking into the microphone, my character will then um, perform that gesture coordinated with my speech. So I'll now say hello in Iraqi dialect. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam. So notice a couple of things here. First of all, notice the immediate response, both the, the, vo the, the verbal response as well as the nonverbal response. This is extremely powerful in its own right. We, we often find it the case that we, you sit people down in front of this, and the first time they say hello and the character responds to them, it's like, Wow, I just had a conversation with, 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 this, with this guy. And, and, and that's, of course, one of the beauties of doing this in a, in a game-based environment. You have that experience, but it's not nearly as threatening as real-life situations, much less a real-life situation in, in Iraq. So, uh, so anyway, oh, and the other thing is you may have noticed little green pluses float up. So. Those of you who are gamers know that that is sort of your health going up. Well, in our context, it means that your, your attitude just went up. Your respect for me just went up. And, you, and, and actually, the trust meters um, moved up a little bit. I should say, by the way, that I'm running this in beginner mode, meaning that it's pretty easy to develop trust here. In the more experienced mode, you have to work a bit harder at it. Although even in this mode, 
you can you can screw up. You, you don't don't take anything for granted. Um, so now um, let's see. Uh, let me introduce myself. Ismi Arif Al Aqdam John Smith. Ahlan wa sahlan. Ismi Ali. And at this point, I could ask Samia for uh, for an, uh, for a hint. Why don't you say Sharafna? Which is a perfectly fine thing to say, but I don't have to follow that advice if I don't want to. So, for example, I'll, instead I will introduce her here. Hadi Mawin Tilarif Samia Faris. Ahlan. Okay, what are you doing in this area? So I need to be able to explain why I'm here, and at this level I can be fairly uh, simple about it. I'll just say, well, we want to help you. And now I could say what Samia suggested that I say before. Sharafna. Sharafna. Okay, so I've managed to um, um, uh, get these guys to trust with trust me. Let's see now if they're willing to cooperate. Yes, sir. Charafna, likewise. Are you going to mislead people that this is what Charafna means? It does mean likewise, but it, uh, but actually, it's a little bit it's it's a little bit um, general in its usage. So when when he said welcome. And I, it's okay to say charafna in re, in response. There are other things you could say instead, but but no, that's not that's, it, it's it's not a problem here. So um, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, so I was listening to what you are saying in Arabic, but I couldn't understand what you are saying. What you what, are saying, what dialect do you speak? Yes. Of Arabic do you speak, I'm sir? Speak, I'm speak Jordanian Arabic, but uh, I understand also Iraqi Arabic. There is no no Jordanian and Iraqi Arabic. It's just Arabic. Mm -hmm. so this, the slag language is different. The street language yes, I understand. It's different a little bit, but there is the standard Arabic. And what you were saying is the standard Arabic. So you didn't say something special in Iraq, but I couldn't understand what you were saying. So you you, you, you could not understand me. Yes, I couldn't understand you. So I think that there are, um, as you know, there are lots of different uh, dialects of Arabic, and and actually, what what I'm speaking here is, is what. Um, uh, 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 Eastern Arabic specialists have have told us is standard um, a Baghdadi dialect, and uh, I'm I'm sorry that you didn't understand me, but uh, I'm, I'm I'm fairly confident that what I am speaking here is is reasonable uh, uh, Arabic for for this for this region. Um, if you're interested, though, I do have a Levantine version here that I could try out for you, and then you could tell me whether you. Uh, whether you find that more under, uh, understandable or not. Uh, but yeah, this is actually a common problem. There are different dialects of Arabic, but um, conventional Arabic instruction really focuses on the written language, what's called modern standard Arabic, which you maybe hear on television, but nobody speaks really. So, so what we have here are, um, is something which is prepares you more closely to what you're going to encounter when you go into a particular um, uh, 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 region. So anyway, I was going to um, um, uh, um, ask where the local leader is in, in, in this district. Minu mas'ul bahal al mantaqa? Huwa Sayyid Jasim al-Wardi. Okay, so uh, with Mr. Uh, Jassim Wardi, and where is he? Wen Huwa. Ibn Biete. Okay, and I'll ask him, well, how do we get to his house? Shlon Ruh Il Biete. Ruhu Adil, Badian Ruhu Ali Amin, Gobl Il Barid, Badian Abru Il Filke. So, and if I had also been practicing in the arcade game of giving directions, I'd be able to understand that. Um, and for my uh, Jordanian friend here, may, might have noticed that I used the word shlon, which is um, Iraqi dialect. So there definitely are some elements specific to this area. So uh, let me now, uh, I've gotten the information that I asked for. 
So let me now uh, head out and try to uh, find the local leader. But I uh, made an important uh, mistake. I uh, failed to thank this fellow, and so he called me a son of a dog, and uh, I failed the mission. But of course, I can uh, restart the scene and immediately go in and try it um, again in, until, I, uh, until I get it right. So, so this is one um, sort of interesting aspect of, of this game-based delivery. We can make it very engaging and, and supportive, but also you can make mistakes and you learn from those mistakes as well. Um, so let's say I wanted to learn from that mistake. And here's one way I can do it, and I'll show you more about this in a moment. We have what we call a skill map, which for each uh, scene in the game that shows what are the objectives, the game goals for that scene and what um, um, skills I need to, uh, to achieve those. And so I can select one of these and then I can look at um, here, that, right, so there are various component skills. These are all on a scale from uh, 0 to 10. I can select one of these and drill down a bit further and I can see, for example, that, okay, and actually what, what I'm showing you, I just loaded this version onto my laptop this morning. So um, um, it's starting with a, with a fresh user model, but already it knows that I know something about using formal greetings, but um, I don't know how to take leave politely yet. So, and then if I say, well, okay, so if I want to learn how to take leave politely, where do I do that? I can see, okay, well, in this lesson of making inquiries, there's a page, say goodbye. So I could then go and refer to that uh, directly. I'll show you in just a moment the, um, the different uh, lessons. But this is actually a, um, sort of a key point here, which is that the, uh, the way, when you put a game um, experience like this into a curriculum, then learners are naturally inclined to uh, approach other learning materials as, as tools that will help them play the game better. And so you can actually exploit that from an instructional design perspective. Rather than put people through this fixed curriculum all the time, give them resources so that they can develop their more, more skills on their own. And actually, um, we found, um, it's interesting working with the Marine Corps in particular, uh, developing uh, training procedures for this. They, they come up with an pro approach which I think makes a lot of sense, which is that they schedule a certain amount of time per day where they say, okay, today you have certain objectives to meet. You need to be able to train up so that you can find the local leader. But if you want to do more practice on your own, you're welcome to do that. So there's sort of this core curriculum plus sort of additional stuff. And sure enough, trainees are motivated to keep practicing on their own to develop their skills. So now let me um, take you to the um, uh, lesson so you can see a little bit um, how that is um, organized. So um, I'm going to take you into the second lesson, the meeting strangers lesson. The very first lesson is just getting started, how to use the microphone, how to say hello, things like that. So then going into this, I can hear two um, um, uh, Iraqi characters uh, meeting each other for the first time. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum as -salam. اسمي ودود شو اسمك اني اسمي شريف كمال اهلا وسهلا اوكي سو هير اي سين ان اكزامبل اوف بيبل سينج ذات ناو اي كان ليرن تو سي ذيس فريزز ماي سيلف سو اي كان هير سمبدي سينج هلو ان اي ريسبكتفل مانر السلام عليكم اند ذن اي كان تراي ذات ماي سيلف Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. And I get immediate um, uh, uh, confirmation that I said the ap appropriate phrase here. 
I should, I should mention that particularly at the beginning level, the speech recognition is very tolerant of error. We don't want people to be discouraged if they're having difficulty speaking the language. Now as you get farther into the lessons, uh, and those of you who, under, who have background in speech technology can understand how this works, that basically the language models become progressively richer and more complex, which means there are more alternatives, which means you have to be more precise in order to get it right. So you, it, it, it sort of naturally falls out of the way the curriculum is designed. Now, we are, we are throwing people into Arabic um, very quickly and, and of course poses a problem because Arabic has many sounds which English speakers have difficulty. So those of you who know the difficulties that um, Japanese people have speaking English, it's even worse Americans learning to speak Arabic uh, well. But so basically we, in, we, we get people speaking but we um, sort of as they encounter new sounds then we sort of explain that to them uh, on the fly. Uh, so for example one of the sounds in alaikum is actually if I go to the pronunciation guide I can see okay this is a sound that we don't have in English. Ah. It's, uh, it's the letter ain in, uh, in, in Arabic. And then there are other sounds that are, that are familiar to English speakers. T th Ch. And ones that are unfamiliar. Ha, 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 ha. And it takes a while to get all these, uh, be able to do these guttural sounds well. But um, we get people into it and get them started, and they're able to at least speak well enough to get themselves um, understood. Um, so that's so. So that was how you said hello. And again, to reply to that. Wa alaikum assalam. And then, when we present vocabulary, it's all present, present, presented in a concrete phrases like this. So you have some context, and then it immediately checks you. Okay, do you remember what you just learned, or were you just reading it off the page? So I need to be able to tell it that hey, if um, if I say, for example, hello to you as well. Assalamu alaikum. Well, um, no, that wasn't it because you don't respond to hello uh, with hello in Arabic. The response is wa alaikum as salam. And that was correct. Then we go immediately to a culture page. So basically, language instruction and culture instruction. Are, are closely integrated here. And it's all put in the context of, of what you need to know in order to deal with particular situations. So here we have an American sh soldier who is um, very rudely addressing this guy with his sunglasses on. Um, here is uh, a, um, another exercise to begin to apply what I'm learning. So if someone says to me, Assalamu alaikum. I should know to say in response, Wa alaikum as salam. And it confirmed that I said that correctly. And the, uh, the, the uh, instruction continues up to the point where I, I can actually practice in a dialogue setting, but still a bit more constrained than the open uh, game context. So I can respond. Wa alaikum as salam. Ismi Fadi. Shismek. Okay, I'll tell him I'm John Smith. Ismi John Smith. Sharafna say John. Sharafna. Ahlan wa sahlan. Okay, so I'm now ready to try this out in, in the mission game. So, um, so this gives you sort of an overview of some of the key capabilities and how the different learning modes are integrated and, uh, and um, uh, complement each other. So now let's talk a little bit more about um, how, uh, first of all, the, uh, where we are with the project, um, what experience we've had, and uh, say a little bit more about the underlying technologies both to create and to use it. So first of all, the history of this now, this actually builds upon technologies that we've been working on in a research lab for a number of years, but it was in 
really, it was April in 2003 that we first got uh, funding to work on language and culture learning. So at that point, we put together a project team. Our team, sir, yes? This is really, really not your fault, but why April 2003 and not April 2002 or October 2001? <laughs> well, this, yes, uh, we could have a long discussion about that. But, um, I'm being unfair. Yeah. yeah um, it, as we've, it, it, it has been remarkable to me how hard it is to get an organization as big as the uh, U.S. military refocused on something. And, and I've got lots of war stories um, about this as we're now shipping this out. So, and I'll get into this more in a bit, but it's taken them a long time to recognize that a problem exists. And it's even taken them a long time to even recognize that given a possible solution like what I showed you, that they could actually take advantage of it. It's been a, taken a lot of, of convincing along the way. Yes? So, Lewis, would you characterize the problem as a lack of priority by the United States military more than lack of sophistication in AI and voice recognition technology? Um, when we started this project, we had no idea whether we would actually succeed in developing the kind of training product that I showed you here. When we first got started, for example, um, a lot of the speech recognizers that we found, particularly those for Arabic, they worked very poorly uh, with language learners, for example. And so we actually had to develop new techniques, training speech recognizers on learner speech in combination with native speech. So, we had, to, so, we, so there, we had to develop the technology and take my word for it that, that we did that. Then there are these additional questions of recognizing, um, is there a problem? Now, that's been something which has uh, taken um, a lot of time to recognize. I mean, there are some people who felt, well, we really don't need to learn foreign language because everyone speaks English. <laughs> And then there are other people that say, well, we already have classrooms for, for learning foreign language. Why do we need this new thing? So it's, it's, it's taken a while for people to recognize, gee, we really need to give lots of people basic skills in, in Arabic. And, and yes, we can expect them to do it. That even though Arabic is a, is a difficult language for English speakers, no matter, we can train them. And so then there's the... Then, but, but anyhow, so, so, so I'm making this a long story, but, but basically it was, up, it was April 20, 2003 when somebody in the military said, gee, this is, this is a, a, a key problem. Let's see if technology could be applied to address this problem. And then things proceeded from there. Yes? Is the same realization true in the, in the Afghanistan front with Farsi, or is that not considered the same level of Pashtun? Uh, Pashtu and Dari actually spoken there, but yes. But the, um, the, um, I think it's a, I think the realization is taking, is occurring across the board now. Um, and part of that has been that there have been uh, pronouncements at the highest level of governments, uh, government now. Yes, language and culture is a critical priority and we need to do, um, uh, we need to support it. So actually in many ways now, the, um, the, the Defense Department is coming out in front in this issue and, I des and deserve some credit for finally seeing the light. I mean, contrast this, for example, with the education establishment, which really doesn't consider foreign language and culture a, a high priority compared to math or, or, or reading. And I'm not saying those aren't priorities, but, you know, it hasn't sort of been elevated to that level yet. Yes? Um, does the world change faster than your simulation? So, given that you've targeted a simulation for Iraq here, let's say that the next language is Farsi. Do you have to now get a new language model? And can you keep up with the world and the events of the world in, in a simulation? So, we are always um, uh, running that race. And that is a, um, that's, that's the double-edged sword of making the um, content task or mission oriented because if the task changes, then the content has to change. Now in practice, 
what we find, say, uh, and I think a te uh, Tactical Iraqi is a good illustration of that, is that of the content that we developed, about half of it is something that really anybody who's going to a foreign country and needs to deal with people should know. You know, how do you introduce yourself, explain why you're there, um, dealing with a tense situation, um, uh, example that, 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 that has a lot of currency. And then there are other material that's more specific to particular types of missions. And so actually at this point we have a family of different um, sets of modules focusing on different missions where there's quite a bit of overlap between them. But nevertheless, if you say, okay, I'm now going to learn how to go through a neighborhood and distribute leaflets. Well, here's what I need to know in, in, in order to do that. So, so our hope is that um, that basically one can come up, eventually come up with a library of these different common situations which will cover to a large measure what it is that people are going to, to have to do. But it's still a, a, a common thing. Uh, what we are trying, actually now trying to convince our funders to do is to keep funding the development of new uh, support for new missions. You know, the old ones are still useful, but now we have new things that we need, we need to, to train. So to continue to develop and, and renew the content material that gets developed. So, so let's see, yes? How much time developing a new mission takes? To develop a, a yeah, so it typically takes us around three months to develop the first um, testable prototype for a new language. So that it means one that, that has a speech recognizer that works pretty well, that has enough content and enough scenes so that you can play it and actually get some experience using it and, and get feedback from users. And, and this is actually a very important part of the way we proceed. We, um, we try to get versions t into learners' hands very quickly and very frequently. We've made many mistakes in the design of our program and we're proud of that because we found those mistakes and then we fixed them so that the next time we don't have those mistakes. So what you see here now is actually the culmination of a lot of experimentation to figure out what works well and there's more that we could do to, it, to improve it. So, so to give you an example here, so we started working on a pro we initially started working on Levantine Arabic because there are many Lebanese speakers in the United States and so we had good access to, uh, uh, to, um, to, um, to native speakers. Around November of 2004 we said, okay, we're now ready to try Iraqi. Of course by then we knew for a long time there was a need for Iraqi but we knew it was going to be a challenge because there are not that many Iraqis in this country. So part of what you need on your team are people who speak the language, who have ex instructional experience. And we happen to be lucky, we've, we've, we found a guy in LA who is an adjunct professor of Iraqi Arabic at UCLA and was willing to work with us and say, okay, now we're ready. We've got our tool set ready so we can now retarget to new languages. Let's see how quickly we can build an Iraqi version based on what we learned from, from, from Lebanese. And sure enough, within a, a few months, we had an initial test version. And then we started um, publicizing that we had um, course train the trainer courses. Basically, people in the military could come and learn how to use this um, uh, this tool. And then we discovered we had a prog a problem on our hands when dozens of Marine reserves showed up unannounced at our doorstep, <laughs> wanting to be trained. So we said, okay, this is getting bigger than what a university lab can handle. So we at that point formed the company and fortunately um, in the military in DARPA they recognized the need of this so they immediately issued us a contract to help um, aid the transition and found us a, a partner, a, a, a set of early adopters who are willing to help with us and work with us and the, that being the Marine Corps. And so in fact, we've been working with what's called OneMEF, the first Marine Expeditionary Force. And I have to say, this experience has been very positive. I have the utmost respect for the Marines, not just for what they do, but 
for their attitude as problem solvers. If you give them a flawed piece of software, they will tell you what's wrong with it, give you constructive feedback, and be patient and work with you to keep trying it again. So um, I recommend them to you. Well, you're Microsoft. You probably are selling lots of stuff to the Marine Corps anyway, so you probably know about this. But um, so what are things that we've been doing recently? So, so we, um, this was co-winner of, of last year's DARPA Significant Technical Achievement Award because it is advanced technology that's, that's having impact in, in practice. What are some of the things that we've been do doing more recently? Well, we've been developing an integrated training package. So what we learn in, in people using this software is that the software by itself is still not sufficient by itself to learn Arabic well. I mean, it would be, it would be a lot to expect that. But, with, but with, with additional supplementary materials, it can be made that way. So for example, we provide users with printed um, workbooks that have the different exercises or, or dialogues that they're learning in the, um, in the game so they can take them home. We've created a website so even when you're away from the game if you just want to you know, go to the website, look up a word or something like that, you can do that. Um, which reminds me, I, there's a whole section of the program that I neglected to show you which is a web-based tool that allows you to actually um, call up the different phrases that you're learning and understand what this, what this grammatical structure is of them. So additional re reference materials. And if I have time, I'll bring that up and, and show it to you as, um, as well. Uh, so some of the key milestones. So the Expeditionary Warfare School, uh, the Marine Corps, they adopted it. And this is now required curriculum for all the Marine captains who go through this. And this has also been very encouraging. These guys, they, they basically, as, as I was mentioning before, they have sort of 12 programmed hours of instruction and they're able to continue on their own. And they are going to get CDs that they can take with them when they go home. And you know, I thought that was a great idea when I first heard about it. But it turns out, actually, they're planning to do more than that. These guys going through this, they don't just want to take it home for their own training. They want to take it back to their units and set up their own training programs. So we've got some, some seeds planted that will have a, a, a big impact. Uh, one math they did, um, uh, they are now, in, uh, we, they have the software and they're using it um, uh, regularly for training, initially in a small scale, but that should be expanding very soon. They've requested um, several hundred additional copies to distribute around Camp Pendleton in, in San Diego, and we're supposed to give them the initial installment of that next week. And so uh, this is going to be a very exciting test to see, you know, if we scale it up to that next level, how well does it work? And then we'll see where things going on, go from there. Then meanwhile, we uh, started working on Pashtu that's, that last fall, had the initial demonstration of that in November. And I have the Pashtu trainer here as well, if you're interested in looking at that. So just say a few lessons that we've learned here. Um, so one is, well, how well does this work? And for what range of, um, of um, of, uh, of learners. And to answer this question, we've been doing it in terms of lots of small scale studies as opposed to some massive study where we're running lots of subjects through it. Now, when we get things in, down in Camp Pendleton, a larger scale, we can do that massive study. But for now, we were really looking at small groups to, to, to uh, test particular questions. And one of them was, well, OK, for what range of learners does this apply? Uh, we initially developed the content that you saw for um, special force personnel, and uh, uh, John Nordlinger in the in, in the back is one of our uh, uh, special force former uh, special force people, and they're of course highly trained, highly mo motivated, and sort of the cream of the crop. Well, what about the general population? How well can they do? What um, uh, sometimes referred to as big army? You know, what can the rest of the army do? Or um, or when this was briefed to a Marine general, he said, well, okay, this might work for officers, but how will Corporal Belt Buckle respond uh, to that? So there was a lot of skepticism. So, um, well, we tried it out. And so we, so here, for example, was one of the, 
a test that we did. This was about um, 20 people who, who took part in a two-week course. They were about, spending about four hours a day with the computer. Uh, they were a range of ranks, um, um, some so senior people, but mostly junior people. These were just sort of people that they had sort of grabbed and told them you, or they, or they were voluntold that they had to participate, as, as the Marines like to say. About half of them had previously been to Iraq. Uh, of those who had been to Iraq, there was, in this group, there was really only one who had any, any appreciable knowledge of Arabic. So clearly their exposure to Arabic was not helping them that much in the past. But the ones who had been there had, they understood why this was, these were important skills to have. And in fact, after about 50 hours of training, um, nearly 80% of them reported that they felt that they had a functional ability in the language within the scope of what they were learning to train. And they all um, rated it very highly on a score of zero to five, at least a four. And the ones that gave them a four is typically they said, well, it's great, but you need to improve it in these different ways. And that was, that was very nice to see. Of the ones that, who had not been to Iraq, um, well, they all made at least some progress. And some made a lot of progress, but certainly less than the other group. And they their overall evaluation was somewhat more negative as well. And I think there are various reasons for that. Uh, some of them are very superficial. The version that we tested, they all had army uniforms and it was army um, uh, vocabulary. And like the guy who gave it a zero said, well, you haven't even trained me how to say I'm a US Marine. And so, you know, <laughs> so we fixed that. You, you can now learn how to say I'm a US uh, Marine. Um, and, um, and they also identified some, some actual problems, you know, bugs in the software and whatnot. But um, uh, I, so a lot of this is correctable by us. A lot of it, I think, will be correctable by the users themselves. And in the future, they'll understand what this is for, and hopefully their officers will explain how you're going to use these skills once you acquire them. So I think we're going to get much higher hit rate in the future. Um, a few other things to mention. So sort of what's the scope of what we're talking about here? So in terms of the code that we've developed, estimate over 80,000 lines of code. Um, I'm, that's an old figure. I'm sure it's, it's up beyond that now. And um, the different game scenes, as you saw, the different arcade game levels, which can be played at different levels of difficulty. The different <coughs> skill builder lessons comprising uh, over 1,200 pages, some of which are authored and some of which are generated automatically. And um, um, I'll show you in a little bit some of the tools that we actually use for authoring, so you can see a little bit how that is done. A uh, total of um, 3,400 speech recordings. Again, that number is going up. And um, about 100 hours of content, I think, uh, with effective use, that can be brought down. So there's a lot of material, um, over 500 words of vocabulary that people can pick up in the course of a few weeks. Um, so here's a summary of the different resources and capabilities, just so you sort of have uh, the whole, um, uh, the overall picture. Um, additional to some, th and additionally some things which I didn't um, show, but I, which I can show in just a moment. So, um, for example, uh, pronunciation feedback. Um, we have that in the Levantine version. We don't have it in the Iraqi version primarily because we were so focused on developing the content for Iraqi and we had very few Iraqi native speakers working with us. They were, we didn't have them available to train the speech recognizer. We're now actually going back and collecting more Iraqi data to provide, do more training and we have more data coming back from users using it, so we now will be able to incorporate that capability. Uh, let's see. Um, so all the things that you saw, as well as the collaborative authoring tools for um, uh, for course content. So, uh, would, you, would you guys like to see the authoring tools? Okay, so let's take a look at that. I'll show you a little bit about how that works. Uh, so let me bring up a web browser. Let's see. Um, uh, 
Yes. Have you uh, talked with anybody at uh, at state in terms of you know what? So State Department publishes you know all the, the area handbooks and they mm-hmm. publish some small things. Because with uh, this language, is there anything to when you're learning this language? I know you've got the cultural stuff in there, but to add anything about the historical perspective of the country they're in, to add the background information. Because the language by itself, without knowing, just like not knowing culture, just like not knowing history. Have you thought about um, the entire package kind of idea? Yes, we have thought about that, and yes, um, there's there's a lot we could we could certainly add. Um, again, the question is how to add it. So, what, what a lot. Connect. Yes. If you don't click connect, you will never do anything. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll do that. Let me try see if I can get on again here. Um, and um, yeah, so I think we c- we can add that now. Um, I um, uh, but we want to make sure that the stuff that we add is they, the people understand how it is relevant to the um, uh, to, to the situation that they're training for. And we do incorporate quite a bit as you go f- uh, forward. So for, for example, when you have your opportunity to meet with the local sheikh then we do include background about, well, who are these sheikhs and what's their role in society and the different tribes and all, and all of that. So that would be an appropriate, so we include some of that, but we really regard that as being, if you will, a, um, um, an appetizer. If people really want to delve into that further, then, then they can do that. And, and as you know, there are various uh, fact books and resources how, uh, that can be employed. A lot of that is kind of it's sort of kind of like an encyclopedia entry, and so it, it, it's it's hard for learners to figure out. Well, why am I learning about the, you know, Umayyad dynasty or something like that? How does how does that apply here? So so that's 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 a real challenge. But I think it's a very solvable uh, challenge. Okay, looks like I am getting out, and. John. Yes. I got a question over email from somebody watching remotely. Mm-hmm. They wanted to know if they could get a copy of this for their reserve unit, their Navy reserve unit. <laughs> ah. <laughs> Tell them to send um, an inquiry to um, inquiries at tacticallanguage.com. I believe you just told them, but I'll read it right. Okay. Do you intend to release this outside of the military or is like America's army? Um, yeah, I'll talk about that in just a sec. <laughs> okay. So right now, um, we're constrained by our licenses. There's a, there's a whole separate set of, of um, aggravation about dealing with game and game companies to get licensing for, to distribute products like this. And this is not your typical game product. So a lot of game companies don't really understand us or understand what we are doing. Um, we, uh, we, are, we did a, a, a obtain a license from Epic Games. They have some understanding of what academics do. Our license currently is just for um, uh, government use, but they told us that they would be happy to extend that to um, to consumer use uh, later on. So as soon as we have that license in place, then we can start making this available uh, to people um, in the in the general community. Um, I should say that our our ambitions are boundless here. We want to change the way we want to change the world. We want people to speak. Get other languages and understand other cultures and 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 so this is all very much part of that at the same time this is a technology that's making a transition from laboratory prototype to product and we have to do that in a careful and staged fashion so I'd say for right now, we, we're going to have to continue to work with early adopters <coughs> as we continue to get the kinks out of it. I think we're getting very close. Well, what I'm very afraid of is just handing it out to somebody 
and they, you know, it, it, you know, they have a conflict with their local firewall, and they say, well, this is garbage. You know, this thing doesn't work. And um, so we want to make sure that there's that we continue to get good press. But uh, but again, I think as long as long as we do that, we can we can manage that. And if you know, a year from now, I think we will be much m much more broadly used than we are now, and we will have a lot more in the way of um, of um, of different languages and cultures. So now let me pull up the um, editor for authoring um, content. So this is the editor, one of the editors we use. We call it UForms. I'm going to pull, look in my um, desktop here for some recent content, which is specified in XML. And let's see, what's, what looks like a good um, one to bring up? This is not the most current, but it looks, it should be reasonable. And I will enter my name. It'll take a little bit of time to download because it's, it's actually downloading the whole set, a whole stack of lessons. Okay, so what have I... Well, actually, it's, a, it's not as big a, a set of lessons as I thought. But okay, so there are a bunch of different lessons. And so now I can select one of these, and I can um, edit it. And here is the different pages, an index of them. And so I can now select one of these. Let me edit that page. And that's what I get for uh, doing a demo on the fly. I think this is what this is. This is an old piece of content, and that's probably why it's not um, coming back. Um, let me do a quick check to see if I've got some more recent content and, that I can pull up instead. <coughs> And all right. Well, that 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 explains it right there. I, I should have checked this before I got in. This is all very old content, and so that's the schema has changed, which is why it's not. Uh, oh wait, wait, wait. Let's see these. Here's something fairly recent. I shouldn't have clicked on that. Well, there you see some XML. So you can see what this looks like um, on the inside. So it's all specifying um, 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 the, um, uh, the internal content. Let me now. Hey, Johnson. Yes. Did you use a web-based approach for the authoring content so that you can broaden the audience of content developers? Typically, game companies will have their own asset pipeline and their own tools for developing the, the levels. Um, yeah, that's precisely right. So, so in fact, um, let, me, um, let me load this up. Let's see, was that 4.5? Yes, it was. So we have an asset pipeline as well, but our assets are different, and we have different um, uh, members of uh, teams participating. Um, another key focus here is we, we understand at the outset that these are under multidisciplinary teams that we are supporting. So we have, you know, we, typically a team consists of somebody who understands the mission, somebody who understands the language, somebody with some, industri uh, some instructional design experience, somebody who's familiar with the game. And so they all need to be able to work together with this common tool set. Uh, we use the web-based approach because it provides, it's sort of more of a common denominator all, that all people can use this. Uh, we find that, that a lot of authors really object to having to install special software on their computer that they have to learn to, um, uh, to use. And even there, the tools are not going to be the complete solution. Um, a lot of 
the um, language and culture experts that we have still have kind of an old school view of computing technology that it's something clerical that 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 um, lear you know learned people do not use these tools. So so um, sometimes what we do is we allow somebody to sketch stuff out using Word and then give that to basic kind of a copy editor who knows how to operate the tool. And then gradually, even those people come around, you know, initially to, to pull up the content and, and suggest changes, and then ultimately uh, um, to, to actually start using it. So I was actually uh, quite pleased when one of my Iraqi colleagues said, OK, I now believe I can use this tool. And so he's actually now working with the tool. But this, this again, is all sort of part of the the reality of making these these tools work effectively for um, for users. So anyway, now let me go in and edit this um, lesson, and this is corresponding more closely to the material that you just saw. It's um, a couple of months old. Okay, so now I can get here then views of all the different pages and their common page types. Uh, let me pick one of these as an example. I selected a page and I edit it. And so I see here the content that's going to go into this particular page. So, so first of all, this is marked as a vocabulary grammar page. This is one of a set of page types that we've defined. Each has a set of, um, of of properties and a set of tools that apply to it. Um, I am editing this from the author's view as opposed to, um, or sort of from the um, from the language expert's view as opposed to the instructional designer's view. Uh, specifically, meaning that there are some things up on the top, uh, atop of the screen. These um, skills. Those were edit, edit, entered by somebody else. So like one guy on the team is responsible for tr tracking all the different learning objectives and making sure that they're covered in the content, and whereas somebody who simply says, OK, well, I'm going to create this little page in explaining um, uh, Hadi or Hada or uh, Haida, Haide in your, in your dialect would be the way it's spoken. Yes, so um, we, um, so then we, 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 we do a little bit of an explanation here. Um, we try very hard to avoid using words like verb and conjugate and noun and stuff like that because that turns off a lot of, of, of learners in, in, this, in this population. So we use lots of concrete examples to sort of explain what we're talking about, avoid linguistic jargon, and then we give different, so here are the different Examples that we're going to include, include in um, in Arabic and in English, and here we've got actually a WAV file. I can hear our recording for that item. Yeah, yeah, whatever. Had a dictor. Okay, so. And if that hadn't been there, then a little um, warning would come up. Warning, there is no recording for this I item yet. So, so this means, for example, that the, that the sound editor can go through this and say, OK, where are we missing sounds? And then make sure that those get in included. So various people can access this stuff. And then whenever I'm done, I can um, basically save this out, upload it back to the server, and then I've done my job. So. Typically, um, a, a, a lesson will go through a whole bunch of different um, um, iterations where different people check it out, make, make changes, augmentations to it, and then, um, and then upload it. So we think that we've got an approach there that's starting to, uh, to work reasonably well. Um, so let's see. We've got a little bit of time here. I could show you um, the Pashtu trainer. Um, I could show, well, in, 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 in deference to my, my Jordanian friend here, I'll bring up the Levantine trainer and then we can give that a try. So I will, 
bring this up. I ha have all this already um, set up. Uh, f although it says Pashto language and training, I know it happens to have Levantine installed in it as well. So I can give you a view of that. What's called the modern standard Arabic. Is that closer to Levantine or what, what type of Arabic is that? It's, it's Arabic. So actually there is no, no like Jordanian or Levantine or Iraqi Arabic. It's just one language, it's just Arabic. Then there's the street language which is different. So everyone has own speak the street sure. language. And most of the people they talk the street language but they don't speak the actual Arabic because it's so hard. So if you speak the actual Arabic it's going to be much harder. If you, like if I go to Saudi Arabia, I understand exactly what they are saying, even if they say, say this, their street language. So I can understand exactly what they are saying and what they want. But when in the writing, when you write something, you write it on the actual language. You don't write it on the street language. And yes. do you understand an Iraqi person on the street yes. or an Egyptian person on the street? Yes, I can understand all of it. Okay. So, but there, but there's a lot, there's a, there's a lot of variability here, and and it's. Um, of course, an American's perspective is somewhat different because they're not accustomed to hearing different dialects of Arabic, so, and they're having difficulty in general. Um, a problem that's been encountered a lot in Iraq is due to many years of embargo, many people in Iraq have not been exposed to other dialects of, of, of Arabic. So maybe you, I mean, you've clearly traveled the world and have uh, experienced different dialects. A lot of people in Iraq apparently have quite a bit more, it's more common that they have difficulty. If you go up to them and speak to them in badly pronounced uh, standard Arabic, you, you don't make very much um, a progress. Yeah, as I told you before, when you were speaking, I couldn't understand most of what you are saying. Mm -hmm. I couldn't understand some, but mm -hmm. not all, most of you, what you are saying. Because there are some letters that I couldn't understand, right. words that I couldn't understand. Yeah. Uh, so, yes. Well, you clearly have a very enthusiastic uh, market out there and, uh, by your evidence, and we don't have enough Iraqi or other Arabic speakers to uh, operate at the scale we need to, so it's a very necessary thing. But do you have any measures of actual effectiveness? Do people retain it? Um, they're, you know, compared to the, if I, if I had 50 hours of classroom training compared to this, you know, what what measures of the, you know, or the hypothesis that this is a good pedagogical method? Uh, do you have evidence? So, so the evidence is is sketchy and comes in 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 in, in different forms. So, so one of it comes from. Uh, the kinds of self-reports that I showed you. Some of it comes from the fact that we um, we actually collect data from people using the tool, so we we can look, you know, over time, do they get to the point where they can start applying these school skills skills without making a lot of errors? Um, the um, we don't yet have the definitive. Uh, evaluations that we would like to have here. Uh, the fact of the matter, though, is that in the case of the Marine Corps, they don't—they didn't know how well their existing training methods were working either. But, but, but this is now clearly the next question. Having having established this, we now need to do these kinds of evaluation studies and and uh, and and get that. I mean, I've, we've done sort of partial studies along the line, but I don't—I still don't think that they capture. The, the current state of the capability of the integrated training system that we've developed. There was another question over here. Yes. Uh, have any copies been pirated yet? <laughs> <laughs> um, no, no. Um, That's a failure. Yeah, it 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 it, it, it will happen. Um, I I've sent a copy to a colleague in Poland, and some of the people on my team thought that. The polls were now pirating our software. No, I said no. This is legitimate. Uh, so we'll see how long we can keep it um, um, 
uh, keep control of that. Uh, one thing we've been talking about to that res with regard to that is is distribute the engine freely, but you'd have to download the content from a server, and that's um, something that we think would we, would help. Um, another thing, getting back to, uh, t to your question about evaluation, one thing that we also would like to know is these people that get out, you know, they go into the country and start using the language, how much of this do they remember, how much do they find useful? So this is something also that I'm hoping that we will uh, be able to um, uh, put in place with our next set of, um, of evaluations with the Marine Corps. And part of the way we're encouraging that is by making people aware, well, there is this website that you can go to for ongoing refresher material, et cetera. So we're hoping to motivate people to come back and check in with us. But it really is a challenging problem because once people get over there, they've got other things to worry about, and it's it's hard to keep track of of really what they're what they're doing. I mean, we, we get lots of anecdotal reports, you know, email coming back say, hey, you know, I used what you taught me um, in this situation, but it's 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 pretty fragmentary at, the, at this point. So. Yes. So, to ask a question for so I can see that there is a lot of advantage for this program over the classroom, which is the ability to uh, to correct things, the correction thing. So I, I say some word, then I press, I say it again, and that's going to correct me and doing this thing. Uh, this is very good advantage for for this over the classroom. So in the classroom, you will not be able to have that ability. Right. So the second question is, what uh, is there a possibility to convert this in the opposite? So making to teach the Iraqi people English language. Language. So this is going to be not uh, English to Arabic. It's going to be uh, not Arabic to English, English to Arabic. So we're very much interested in teaching uh, English to foreigners as well. And I'm not sure where we will start with that. Um, I, like you, thought that that Arabic to English would be a, would be a natural um, place to start. And we actually proposed that, but that raised an objection, which is that if we were to be teaching Iraqis to speak English, it would give the impression that the U.S. was acting as an occupying imperial power that was teaching the imperial language to the people. So that, even though it might have been a very useful thing, it was shot down for, for these political reasons. But I, I do expect that we will eventually do this. And there are other possibilities. We've been talking, for example, with a group um, that is um, uh, in Malaysia that's trying to teach um, Arabic to Malaysians. Because there are lots of people in Malaysia, they want to be able to study the Quran, and they, and they, and they don't have enough uh, teachers to, uh, to, to teach it. So there, we, we may end up we could well end up with a Malaysian Arabic version before a, um, an Arabic English version, but obviously there are lots of combinations here at, that, that are that are worthy of of, uh, of investigation. So um, I'll uh, um, I'll now say hello here. Oh, by the way, um, so this is the page that corresponds to what you saw the Assalamu Alaikum here. Um, uh, we don't say that in this version. Sir, could you, could you explain why we use marhaba instead of assalamu alaikum here? Uh, all of them are the, the youth, so you can say, say hello, so you can say assalamu alaikum. Actually, and you can say marhaba, you can say a lot of phrases other than hello. So it's not just hello. So there are many things to say hello. Yes. One of them is assalamu alaikum, marhaba, and uh, you can answer like marhabtin or yeah, there are many things right. to answer to do the same thing. This, yes. So it depends on the country usually. Uh, yeah. So, so for example, in Iraqi, you do people do say marhaba, but it's considered more informal than uh, than assalamu alaikum is. Uh, an issue in Lebanon is Lebanon is a multi-ethnic society, and if you say assalamu alaikum to somebody, it gives the impression that you're presuming that the person is a Muslim. Whereas marhaba is more um, confessionally neutral, 
and that's why it was recommended that in Lebanon that is what you would use. In Jordan it would not be quite the same thing, although it's, it's the same language. Used to, uh, the other thing, marhaptin, that's it, that, that literally means, means two hellos. Uh, when, when a lot of Arabs, when they look at this, it, it's, they say, well, you know, you're teaching, uh, you know, howdy y'all or something like that. It, it seems very kind of um, um, uh, local and provincial. Yes, you, you a question over here? Just comment, uh, the newspaper say that uh, a lot of Palestinians now start saying uh, uh, salam alaikum as a spoof on the, on the Islamic victory in the elections. They used to say marhaba, they say salam alaikum and they laugh. <laughs> <laughs> they say on the Hamad victory. Yes. So this is all sort of just examples of how language and culture are, are inseparable and how you need this. I just want to say yes. something else also for salam alaikum. Salam alaikum means two things. Salam alaikum means death. Assalamu alaikum means beef. The same word. It's <laughs> so, the, same, the same phrase, assalamu alaikum, it means beef. And it means also peace. Yes, mm -hmm. so right, same, that's right. It's the same peace thing. be with you. Salam so, means, so means peace, you, yes. When the Muslims usually say assalamu alaikum, they say assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. That's assalamu alaikum. Mm -hmm. means peace on you and the mercy of God is on you. Mm -hmm. So that's that's the mean assalamu alaikum. But if you say assalamu alaikum only and you don't say anything and that was a military army, so I would think of, I will answer wa alaikum. Uh -huh. So he means right. that this is the day, you know, this, that's, that's also on you. Right. <laughs> so if that's, yeah. So, so this version, in addition to being the different dialect, Marhaba. it also uh, will have pronunciation feedback here. Um, and we'll see how well it works. It's a little bit flaky, but let's say I try to repeat that. Marhaba. Marhaba. Mm. So, <laughs> this is deliberate. Um, we've done a lot of study of how, um, what, what, how tutors employ what are called in psycholinguistic literature politeness strategies, basically ways to address the face and status of the person that you are, uh, are dealing with, as opposed to just conveying information. And also, um, um, social things like flattery. So this guy has, I mean, I've just been flattered here and, it's, and it does uh, make you laugh, but we have done studies that show that these, this kind of treatment really does have an effect on learning if applied properly. Um, it's, um, if people feel like they're being given false information, then they get frustrated. Um, so let me let's sort of play around with this a little bit more. Let's say, for example, that I um, mispronounce this, and let's see how it goes. Marhaba. Marhaba. So, uh, yeah, so this model actually, it doesn't um, keep a history of things, but you see it's, 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 what's literally going on here is it knows that what I've done is substandard but it can't pick out a specific mistake that it can comment on. So it's sort of trying to, in a friendly way, sort of keep encouraging me to keep going, but, um, but still give feedback as, as, far, as far as how well I'm, uh, I'm doing. Uh, let's see, some more examples. Ahlan wa sahlan. So let me uh, try saying that. Alam wa sahlan. Alam was salen. Mm. Well, so it's a little bit too lenient uh, in this case. But um, anyway, this gives you uh, a sort of sense of, 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 how, of, of, of how this works and also a reason why we're still um, uh, working with this in the lab. Actually, there, there are two sets of issues here. Let me explain uh, the technologies underlying this. So, so part of it is the the technology of detecting errors in the first place. And, and that is done through a two-pass process where we first do uh, recognition against a, a, um, a grammar that includes common errors as well as a forced alignment against the expected utterance to be able to check the, um, the confidence score there. 
And so that typically yields an overall degree of confidence that the person said the right thing and sometimes identifies particular errors with enough degree of confidence that they can, uh, uh, that they, they, they can be um, um, uh, addressed. Then there's a, a separate module which is looking at those errors and first of all is doing a determination how significant is this error. So a lot of errors are, just are not mentioned because they don't really have that much of an impact on intelligibility. Um, if an error is, if there are multiple errors and it finds the mo one that's the most severe, then it decides what's the um, uh, appropriate way of responding to that and that depends upon the, the model of the learner where it's taking into account not just uh, the level of proficiencies that you describe but also um, its estimate of the degree of self-confidence or motivation of, of, the, of the learner so that that can actually change the type of feedback that is um, is provided so um, so anyway that that's that's the basic framework and um, we think can, uh, pro is potentially very useful here, but, also, but it's also something that has to be prov um, applied very judiciously. This is another reason why, why we um, test this out in the lab, but we're still evaluating it in the field because we see one negative consequence of a, providing this kind of feedback or pronunciation feedback in general is it gets people focusing too much on the pronunciation and not enough on the overall communicative skill that they are acquiring. So even when we are able to detect errors accurately, we still think it's best to only mention those errors occasionally. You know, don't be constantly reporting errors because then they're just going to be focusing on those errors and they're not going to make progress and then they're going to get frustrated and just all kinds of negative consequences will arise from that. Uh, John. This seems ideal for a console because it requires a headset, microphone. Hmm. Have you talked to the Xbox folks yet? Has, have you talked to any console people? Um, we have not talked to the console people and I would it would be great if in my visit here we could, um, we could reach some, uh, some accommodation there. I, I'll, I'll be frank with you, I've been, I have not been optimistic that we would be able to get this onto an Xbox because I know you guys regard the Xbox as a loss leader for your selling games and we don't expect to sell millions of copies of this. So like a lot of educational applications, we're looking for some kind of deal that will allow us to deliver it on the console in the volumes that, that make sense for this particular market. Yes? Actually, it's kind of a related question. I was actually on the Xbox team and the, the designer of the headset, actually. Mm -hmm. So um, um, one of the points that we have in the Xbox is that it's native speakers speaking a native language, say English, right? Um, and the, what you can say is much, more, is much broader than a few known phrases that I know. And one of the challenges we had was the language model on the AI side was much more complex mm -hmm. in order to receive this unbounded input. Yep, off that's script. a very hard problem, yes. And so I see that you guys have solved it, but you have a very limited input vocabulary that the person, you know because you've trained them already, what they can say in the situation. Yes, so, so it's, it's, it's a real... Um, um, yeah, there are, uh, there are a number of design trade-offs that you, that you have to work with. And so, yes, we, we initially tried to identify some areas in that design space where things would work reasonably well so that the, that the, um, uh, that the um, domain was reasonably constrained but not overly constrained. And, that, that, and that, achieving that in part involves a certain degree of iteration where we basically put learners in front of this thing and see, oh, are they saying things that we didn't anticipate? And often it's quite understandable. It's, you know, they learned it in the lessons and it just happened to not have been uh, taken into consideration in the, in the design of the grammars used in the, in the game portion. Um, but we do recognize that as learners um, advance to higher, higher levels of proficiency that we're going to have to be able to to open things up a bit. One question is how to actually design that, expand that language model. One idea that we have for that is 
rather than make it completely wide open, so you can just say anything in the, in the language, still have it be a restricted grammar, but automatically introduce variations into that grammar. So basically, if the, if the learner knows how to conjoin phrases you, you know, using and or uh, wa in, uh, in, in Arabic, well, okay, automatically put that in the grammar. So then when you put in phrases, then it should automatically be able to recognize conjunctions of those phrases as well. So I think we can do a fair bit of that. And our idea is to do that at authoring time because we want to avoid putting a, a heavy natural language processing engine into the pipeline here. It's, the, the challenge is to keep the latency down so that it feels like a natural conversation. And we're, uh, but I think within those limits, we can still expand. The, there's still possibilities to expand here with, the, with, this, with this technology. And now, uh, one more follow-up yeah. point, that is that for a publisher in the game industry, they want you to have not only a little button on the screen to take off your glasses, but also select weapon and select first-person first shooter mode. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if that talks to human nature or the game industry. <laughs> I haven't quite figured that one out. Have you considered adding an aspect like that? If, let's say you spoke really poorly, that you'd have to defend yourself. <laughs> yeah, we've 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 we, we've thought that about that a lot, and so my inclination. Is, so so the part of it that I ascribe to a lot is that if if you do stupid things, there should be negative consequences of it. And right now, those negative consequences are verbal. You know, people will get up and say, oh, you know, get out of here, I'm Yankee occupiers, we can't stand having, you know, or you're in the CIA spy or things like that. So they get into, into tense situations. Um, yeah, we will probably add firefights, but we want to make clear that, that the firefight is a sign that you lost rather than a sign that you won. This is not a shooting game, well, and the goal here is not to shoot you Arabs. Have a fire fight yes. that you could resolve by discussion or by negotiation rather than just continuing to fight. And that mm -hmm. would be a useful thing. That's right. Yeah, that, that's 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 the key, and and actually that's, that's quite right. Even even when you are challenged in this game, we try to build in an option so that if you're smart, you can you can respond to that challenge and defuse the, the situation. So that's very much part of the training, absolutely. I think you were waiting for a, a, a question, I was, Kent. I was uh, thinking about your, your surveys earlier, mm -hmm. people who had been to Iraq and the people who hadn't, and I think that many Americans who have no language training obviously operate from the perspective of my culture is normal and right. understanding how handicapped you're going to be if you don't have any working skills. How do you overcome that, particularly with the never been to Iraq group, to help them appreciate that this isn't about, I mean, because the only other resort is, as, as John was saying, okay, shoot them up, you know, I don't understand you, just, you know, blow, blow the guy away, which, you know, in the context of the game, is you lost. <laughs> it's, a, it's a challenging problem, and, and I... I'm not sure how much we solved it in general, but I've seen some things that I find very encouraging. So one thing which I, th which just really tickles me is when I see these tough Marines competing to see how good they can do a job of establishing trust with these people in the cafe. I mean, when I see that, I say, wow, may I hope that this is ha having some impact when they actually deal with people in the, in the, in the, in the real world. I think some of this comes up just because it forces you into situations where you have to think about the situation, think about what you did wrong. So one of the, um, of the scenes which um, I think is very v valuable is one where you're invited into an Arab home and to meet with a local sheikh. And yeah, a lot of trainees look at that and say, well, why do I need to um, learn this. I'm not going to be invited into any Arab's home. And so we have to, we have to somehow overcome that. But, but I, I do believe the people going through that, it really sort of forces them to come to grips with notions of cultural differences and respect. In particular, um, 
there's it's very important. I mean, it's true in, in true in all cultures, but the but the Arabs are very seri uh, concerned about this. Is this notion of of reciprocity, of showing of showing respect mutually. You know, if I um, I mean, assalamu alaikum, wa alaikum assalam is just one example of that. But you know, if if you sit down with someone, they're going to ask you, well, how are you doing? Ask about your family, and they're going to expect you to do the same. So just going through that kind of experience sort of gets you thinking, wow, you know, these are people and they expect to be respected and, and I can understand that. So I think it would be very interesting to actually follow up with people who've gone through that and say, okay, well, how has this changed your view of, of interacting with, with, with people over there? I'm, I'm hopeful, but the, the evidence remains to be seen. So it's afternoon. I guess we have to wrap up. Well, what's at this point? Yeah, we should, we should uh, end this. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, my pleasure. Ahmed Sahlan. <laughs>